Good morning. Today's topic is grain inward, grain outward. Growth is natural to every living being. The scriptures say that every living being goes through five stages. Jayate, Asti, Vardhate, Viparinamade, Apakshiyate. One is born, then he exists or she exists, then there is growth, after that maturity, and after maturity there is declination and then death. Apakshiyate, Nashyati. So this growth to a certain stage is in the Every living being there is growth. After that, growth stops when maturity comes. And then there is degeneration and finally death. We know as a child we are born small, then slowly we grow and we become a human being of our size. Our physical body grows. Our intellect becomes mature. Emotions are trained and sublimated, that all comes in, under growth. Body, brain, nerves, mind, spirit, everything grows. They say that every puppy that is born becomes a dog. Every kitten that has come to this world, if it doesn't die early, becomes a cat. But every human child doesn't really become a human or man in the real sense. That may become a brute, that may become like animal. To become a human being, growing a child into a real human being, a civilized human being, it needs to undergo education and training. By that, the child will grow into a real human being. So we understand the growth of body. We understand the growth of brain and nerves. All internal organs they grow. They were small in the beginning, from heart to liver to everything. And they grow into maturity when we grow. But what about the spiritual growth? And today we are more concerned with the growth, inward growth and outward growth, not the outward bodily growth that we are talking or inward inner organs growing we are talking, we will be talking about and we are concerned about the growth of spirituality or spiritual growth in ourselves. So spiritual growth can be described as the strengthening and manifestation of divine qualities inherent in man. So when those are manifested in your life, that is spiritual growth. In the Gita there is enlisted many score of divine qualities. Abhayam, Sattva, Samsuddhi, Jnana, Yoga, Vivasthiti, Dhanam, Dhamascha, Yajyascha, Swadhyaya, Stapadam. There are about 24 or 26 divine qualities mentioned. Like fearlessness, <coughs> purity, Knowledge, charity, self-control, sacrifice, austerity, non-injury to others, truthfulness, renunciation, peace, absence of jealousy, kindness to all, non-covetousness, forgiveness, etc., etc. These qualities are there. We need training and discipline to manifest that outward. Inside there are qualities inherent like seed form, and those need to grow inwardly and its effect will be manifested outwardly. Inward growth should correspond with outward growth. There should be inner peace, happiness and outward that should manifest as love and service. Then there is real growth of the human species, then there is real formation of human being. Otherwise, we just tend to be another species of so many varieties of animals. Like there is tiger, 
having some Latin name, Panthera tigris, then they will be like human being. Who are you? I am Homo sapiens. We are not just uh, an animal in this huge world in creation like any other animal species. We are human beings, so much different because we have spiritual growth in us. There is not only physical and mental and intellectual growth, but there is spiritual growth in us. Swami Ranganathalandi very nicely defined that what is spiritual growth. He says, are you growing spiritually? What does that mean? Then he says, can you love others? That is one sign of spiritual growth, loving others. Then he says, how much that love should be? To its, grace, to its fullest it should be, can you feel oneness with others? Love, when that love matures, feeling oneness. And when oneness is felt, when another person is hungry, you feel that hunger. When another person is in pain, you feel that pain. When another person is in joy, you feel that happiness. That is the feeling of happiness, that feeling of oneness, mature, the love mature into oneness. Second point, Swami. Ranganath Padmini stresses that the sign of his spiritual growth. Have you peace within yourself? When one, that suffering, because of seeing the suffering of others, does not take away your peace. That makes you very peaceful because you are able to help others. You feel pain, but that pain is not selfish misery. That is different kind of suffering that you have. You put your heart and soul to remove the suffering of others, but peace never leaves you. Do you feel that peace inwardly? The third point, love, oneness, peace. These are all sign of spiritual growth. Inside you feel peace. Holy Mother used to say, why do people talk about misery and anxiety and worries? I find as if a jar of peace, a pitcher of peace is placed within my heart. Nothing happens. All very problematic families she had to leave. But she always was peaceful. So the problems of life should not take away our peace. That is what spiritual growth is. The third point. The fourth point. And do you radiate it, that is peace, around you? Not only you have peace within yourself, but peace is in so much abundance that it just radiates. When anybody comes who needs peace and solace to you, just being with you, he feels peace. You are radiating that peace out of your love and oneness for others. You are so much filled with peace. I told you one incident of Ranganath Ranji. One young lady doctor came to him in Delhi and she had a lot of problems in her life. And the doctor related for one hour about her problems in life. Ranganath Ranji didn't speak anything. And on the, when she was telling her all the problems that she faced, she was crying and just relating her story. Ranganath Anji didn't say anything. After she finished, Ranganath Anji said, from this moment, all your problems are resolved, all are gone. You have no problem left with you. He just said that thing. And it was already one hour over. Other people were waiting for Ranganath Anji. The lady had to leave. She knew Ranganath Anji from very young, when she was a child, when he was in Delhi. The lady described his story. She told to me, as soon as I came out of the room of Ranganath Anandi, I really felt that all my problems were gone. All anxieties, worries, troubles, all were gone. I was filled with peace. That is radiating peace. You have so much of peace. Swami Swahanandi asked once one senior Swami, people come with so much of problem, so much of bereavement. What should I say to them to remove their suffering? I don't find any words to console them. Senior Swami, Swami Swahanandi told this to someone. Senior Swami told, you don't have to speak anything. No word can calm that person who is burning with the spirit, with the suffering. The peace that you have inside will touch that person and take away its burning of suffering. So the peace has to be radiated out. So much peace you have, that is to be radiated out. Swami Ranganath on the fourth thing for spiritual growth is, do you radiate that peace that you have inside, outside? Then he says, fifth thing he says, that is called spiritual growth. 
these four things, how will that be practiced, stimulated? That is called spiritual growth, which is stimulated by meditation inwardly. How will you have that love, that oneness, that peace in what, that peace radiating? It has to be great through meditation, prayer, worship, divine love for the divine. That is one way by which you bring out all the goodness, all the qualities that God has given you, 26 divine qualities, from fearlessness to service to truthfulness, everything that is in you, kindness that is everything in you. You need to bring those out. How will you do that? Stimulated by the meditation in worldly. Will that everything bring out? That is still incomplete. The sixth and last point, Swami Ranganathan, he says about the spiritual stimulation and, and the spiritual growth. That is called spiritual growth, which is stimulated by meditation inwardly and work done in a spirit of service outwardly. Then there is need for yourself to serve others, to approach others, to be connected with others. Not that you sit in a corner and meditate. That's what when Swami Vivekananda said, I want to enjoy meditation, the bliss of Anam, he was Dhyana Siddha, Nitya Siddha, Swami Vivekananda. Sri Ramakrishna said, no way doing that. You have to go and serve the people. You have to teach them and suffer yourself. Swami Vivekananda suffered a lot. But that suffering was not the suffering like ours. That was unselfishness that was there. As a person who loves another and feels the other's pain, doesn't suffer, the selfish man suffers. That Swami Sri Ramakrishna said to him, that being with peace is yourself is not for you. You have to give that peace and joy to others. Maybe for that you have to have some suffering in this creation when you are born a man. You will be like a huge banyan tree. So inward growth and outward growth, when we start connecting, after we enrich ourselves with the spiritual quality, the spirituality, and then we connect ourselves. So should one cultivate all the spiritual qualities, have no connection with others, and then after you are full of spirituality, then you start radiating that? No. It may take lifelong time to become fully, completely spiritual. Whatever spirituality we have, when we start communicating with others, when you start loving others, that spirituality grows inwardly again. When you start outward connection, outward service, outward love, inwardly also that growth comes, it enhances. So this there should be together, inward and outward spiritual growth should go together. Swami Vivekananda said, sign of spiritual growth is cheerfulness, happiness. A spiritual person cannot be sad, cannot be morose, cannot have that long face, cheerfulness. How to have that cheerfulness? Spirituality, of course. But Gita in the Gita it is said, how can one be happy? Kuta Sukham. Sri Krishna says, First, you have to have peace. Then only peace will follow happiness. Everybody wants happiness. Every being wants happiness. In fact, all when we eat food, why do we eat? We eat because we are suffering from hunger. There is thirst, we drink water. So, we want to be peaceful, happy. We want to be happy. Happy by removing all the obstacles to happiness. And then we feel happy. Then happiness, Sri Krishna says, how can one be happy? You have to be peaceful. Asantasya kutasukam. Where is there happiness without peace? Peace is the precursor of happiness. Now how to get peace? That's also the problem. There's so much of restlessness, so much of problem. How to get peace? Swami Adishwaranji very nicely analyzes how can one pursue the next step in Gita Dhanasi. How do one pursue peace? Peace of mind needs self-control. Without self-control, you will not have peace of mind. To further self-control is all our spirituality, all purity. How can we have control over our mind? 
the mind when it is purified will be easily controlled when it is impure it cannot become controlled so to control ourselves or our mind we need to purify the mind abhayam sattva samshuddhi in the gita also it is said purified mind is a sign of divine quality so peace of mind can come through self control what is self control or self mastery in his words self mastery is asserting control over our subconscious urges desires habits and tendencies so all those we have which we know which are not good which is not expressed which is not be seen we need a firm affirmation and attempt to control such corpses such types of habits and tendencies and he says self mastery is not letting things happen but making them happen when you have self control you don't let things as it happen then you have command over how the things should happen how should you speak how should you behave oh why did i speak that to him oh that person was i should not have told that it doesn't happen when you have self control over your speech when you have self control over your speech over your mind you don't do anything anything that that is not good for you or good for others you have fully control over your mind over your speech over your thought and that we practiced the self mastery can come only through assertion only through practice by itself it doesn't happen now how this how it will be easy to control self is uh, sri krishna also said in the gita it's very difficult to control arjuna the mind control is like catching the wind it's almost impossible but not impossible two ways abhyasa and vairagya practice and renunciation practice and detachment that's a better word for way down here you try to practice the control of yourself when you talk with others be conscious what are you talking not the lay words just come out of your mind without your control over them you have control over that and you need practice you must think through practice it can be achieved so to have the self control you go one step behind happiness will come through peace peace will come through self control and how the self control will be easily attained through self mass self awareness self control is dependent on self awareness when we are aware of our true self then it is easy to control our mind when we understand mind is our servant we are not the mind then it is easy to control the mind and mind is instrument when you become the mind and you are swayed and dragged and pulled and pushed by the mind and you totally identify yourself with the mind who will control whom mind is controlling you you have forgotten yourself you are the controller and ruler of the mind you are the true self you are omnipotent you are very powerful this self awareness if we could inculcate it will be easy to control the mind this life that we have god should have a purpose what is the purpose of course spiritual growth but to say in a more concrete way so we will get on the said atmano mokshartham jagat hitai sir you have to have that what swami ranganath and he said in word peace expression of that peace radiating that peace of god doing for your freedom atmano mokshartham independence attaining achieving that freedom being aware that you are not dependent on anything in the world world is not dependent on you you are free and that is the half other half jagat hitai devote yourself dedicate yourself for the good of humanity service of god in man how to worship god worship god as service to man it is not service to man it is worship of god and another how we can do that work as worship every work you do treat it as a worship to lord as a yagya 
Say that Sri Krishna Paramastu. I offer this word as a worship to Lord. Oh Lord, you be pleased. That is another way by which we can perform the Atmana Moksha Tamjagathita is a practice. It's a worship, it becomes a spiritual practice. Two ways, work and worship, every bit of work, and service of God in man, Shiva Gyanya Jiva Shiva. Bhagavad Gita analyzes the gunas in the 17th chapter that it says, Dhanam Dhammasya, it says, the dana should not be given up. The dana, tapasya, should not be given up. It says, what does it say? It says, dana means gift by implication, what we offer to others, including service of various kinds. The inferior or tamasic kind of service is that which is offered without respect or with disdain. There are three kinds of service to others. One is lowest kind, tamasic. You do serve others, but you do without any respect and you try to help others without unto unworthy person at a wrong place and time. You want to give something gift, but it is not needed that time. One person is uh, needs some uh, some nice consolation or needs some nice good words, and you go on and start taking and uh, talking with him about uh, high philosophy of Advaita. You know that person. That's not the right kind of gift to that person. That's called tamasic gift. Unworthy person in the wrong time, given with disrespect. That is the that is also service, but it's the lowest kind of service which have which will have no nice fruits. It will not produce good fruits. The mediocre kind of service is offered grudgingly and with the expectation of a return of favor or the meritorious fruit of the act. So from the person you help, you do. First you just do with the two purposes. One is you want something, praise, happiness at the time of need, he will help you or she will help you. And another is you want merit in heaven after you die, I am doing something. That is mediocre called Rajasik Dana. And what is Sattvika Dana? The Sattvika Dana or the superior kind of service is offered with a feeling that it is one's duty to give. Such an offering is made to a worthy person who can make no return at the right time and place. Clearly it is the superior kind of service that can help us in our inner growth. The following factors emerge from the Gita. Service should be offered to a worthy recipient at the right time and place without expectation of a return of favor, without desire for the fruits of action and with due respect to the recipient. <coughs> respect to recipient is very important. Swami Vivekananda just said that you have five cents in your hand and you just say to a, to a person, needy person you gave and say you should be thankful to me. That is not giving. You should offer whatever you can offer with due respect as if you are worshipping God. It's not that the givers will, uh, the, the receiver will thank the giver. Givers should thank the receiver for allowing him to practice uh, service so that he can be purified. It is the Receive it is the giver who is purified, who is benefited by giving something to the giver. Swami Vivekananda said, it should be the giver who should kneel down before the receiver and offer whatever gift he can offer. The important factor in transferring service is respect for the recipient. This becomes spontaneously possible when we do service in the spirit of worship of God, dwelling in the recipient. In the Bhagavad Gita, God incarnate says Kapila underlines the futility in the, sorry, in the Bhagavata, God incarnate says Kapila underlines the futility of worshipping God in images, disregarding his presence in his creation. He says, if one disregards me, present in all beings as their soul and God, but ignorantly offers worship only to images, such as worship is as ineffective as a sacrificial offering made in ashes. So no, it will not be accepted, it doesn't go to, go to the fire. 
Therefore, Sri Krishna says, Worship me in all beings by offering respect to all beings and service to them in a spirit of friendliness and an attitude of non-separateness. For I am the one self in all beings and have made a temple for myself in all of them. What is important is an attitude of oneness in God that leads to an important corollary, service done with discrimination, based on caste, creed, and so on, is anything but a spiritual discipline. Service becomes effective only when prompted by selfless love towards the objects of service. Now, regarding this service Swami, Bhutananti, though he was an unlettered person, he never read anything, but how great wisdom he had through his spiritual practice and through the grace of Sri Ramakrishna. Once two European ladies came to meet him in Calcutta. The ladies were, they believed in serving the society, but they were atheists, they didn't believe in God. So they were trying to ask Swami Adbhutananji, they came that Ramakrishna Mission is engaged in service, so they came to talk with him. And uh, with the help of interpreter, Swami, they asked the question, uh, what is really the service? Swami Adbhutananji replies, Latu Maharaj said, those who do not believe in God and try to serve humanity cannot carry on for a long time. Sometime after this question naturally crops up in their mind, what benefit do we derive from these so-called humanitarian activities? And then they reach the, this stage, these activities appear stale to them. They lose interest in their works, and this change is bound to come. It is but natural for all philanthropic activities. Entail personal sacrifice. Those who are not believers in God do not find any reason or meaning in such sacrifice. So this girl, this woman didn't believe in God, but they wanted to serve humanity. Swami Adbhutanandi says, when you do a, just a philanthropic activity without any higher divine purpose, a spiritual purpose, your activity is bound to bring negative reaction in time. It is very difficult to really serve without having higher faith in higher in, in divinity. Hearing this, the two ladies laughed out and the younger one said, That is no argument. That is no argument. Latu Maharaj, without turning a hair, will you tell me, why do you engage yourself in these activities? The younger lady said, For the good of others, of course. Latu Maharaj, How am I benefited therefrom? Why should I slave for others? What for? The elder lady, We live in this society. As such, we have some duties towards it. Our religion is to serve this society. As long as we live in this society, we should mutually try to mitigate our sufferings and enlarge the sphere of happiness. That should be the end of our lives. No belief in God, no belief in soul, no belief in higher purpose. Latu Maharaj then replies to this, you see how wonderfully he replies to this. There is a higher ideal than what you have said just now. It is to know and to fulfill the ideal of your own life. To realize God is the one grand end of human life. He really is wise who has done it or at least tries to do it. To do good to others is after all a social matter. It has it, is, it has no necessary connection with that highest aim of human life. Moreover, look at it from another point of view. Benefit accrues to those for whom you work. What about yourself? How do they benefit you? Can you explain to me how working for others is profitable to you? At this the ladies blushed and kept mum. Latu Moral went on. So you see, there is a loophole in your argument, a fallacy. In all arguments that want to base humanitarian activities on social benefits and leave aside God, you will invariably find some fallacy or other. But once you bring in God, the distinction between you and others vanishes. Then others become a component part of myself. Though outwardly, that is with relation to body, others appear different from me. 
inwardly, that is at Satchidananda, we are all one. We don't find any difficulty in understanding and feeling that we are one in God. Then nobody helps another, one that is different from himself, but serves his own self, the abiding part of himself, the better and truer self of himself. Our attitude is plainly this. We go out to serve others, not because there are others who are suffering, but because we want to obliterate, blot out the false distinction that exists between others and myself. And this seeing others as distinct from myself is the root cause of all the evils in society. So to us, to do good to others really means to do good to ourselves, not others, but myself. And who is there who would not do good to himself? Hence, if you leave out God and try to do good to others, you may lose your zest for such activities after some time. A wonderful explanation of need of higher purpose in serving than just serving the society, just serving the humanity. Unless there is service with the intent of unity of the spirit, the service is likely to become not that, of that quality. Or later some problems may come, ego may come. Sri Ramakrishna said, you think that you are serving with a spirit of dedication and true unselfishly, but you don't know when the ego enters, when imperceptibly your self-interest comes. <coughs> And this type of service has been seen in the lives of so many monks of Ramakrishna order. To go to Swami Nishayananda just read in the morning. The, the story one that said how much he served the people in Kankal. He used to go from Haridwar to Rishikesh on foot. I think it is about six miles. So walking about two or three hours in the morning going there and distributing their medicine and again in the evening, he would come late at night. Next morning again he would to go. Day after day, he served the poor people of Rishikesh, going every day, committing every day on food from Haridwar. Those who have visited Haridwar and Rishikesh, go by bus, it takes about one hour to reach there by bus. More than one hour. You know how long it took by walking. So, but he did that. He had so much of dedication. One Swami Vivekananda asked him to bring cow from the uh, other side of the Ganga. So while he was bringing the cow swimming, from, he was swimming and cow was also swimming on the Ganga. And in the, in the mid Ganga, the, the, the cow somehow left it away. Then Swami, Swami this Nishyananda swam and held the, the rope of the cow and he was carried away, much down below the river. So he had to walk. In the afternoon, he came after many hours of walking. He was of that dedication type. And you know the how he was dedicated and loved Swami Vivekananda. Organized, prayed to stop in that time so that they could see Swami Vivekananda. So much of love that Swamiji could produce through the printed letters that he spoke in the United States, in the West, in Europe. So the, the, the feeling that was there in Swami Vivekananda could just radiate. Not only through the person, when there is so much of feeling there in the heart, that feeling doesn't depend even the living person. Even the printed word words, they will carry that feeling, that impression, that inspiration is carried through the living, that written words printed black and in, in the black and white. When we read gospel, we feel that way. I was sitting and studying, reading, I studied one devotee was reading some book, a spiritual book on the devotee's life. And I could see his face just smiling, happy. This is just blessing as one has in good meditation, as if he's seeing Easter. There was so much of joy in catching the spirit of the personalities. Great. What did talk of Swami Nishyananda and Kalyananda? They were touched and blessed by Swami Vivekananda. Very fortunate person. Those Sister Christine wrote, those who have seen Swami, heard of Swami Vivekananda, they are blessed. Those who have seen, they are blessed. Those who have touched his feet are thrice blessed. So like that, they have touched the feet of Swami Vivekananda. They are really very special persons. But other person, other monks, like Swami Ranganathananda to talk about, his life of service, he lived 96 years. At the age of 18, he joined. 
and he died in 1995 and 96. And from after 18 till he died, all his life was service. He used to give talks, inspire people, take away, and his attitude was how to give them happiness, how to give them joy, how to remove their ignorance, how to remove their suffering. That was only his concern. And when he gave talk, he used to meditate, try to give, and, and, and it was, he, he in fact went, went one day to Swami Akhandananda, and the Swami, he prayed to Swami Akhandananda, Maharaj, please bless me, that I may speak Swami Vivekananda's ideas to the people. Khandaranji blessed. And what Swami Ranganathanandi gave was Swami Vivekananda. He, just, he could touch people with the spirit of Swami Vivekananda. That he did throughout his life. When he was 95, 96 years old, sick, many ailments at that old age, he used to give his spiritual instruction, he used to give diksha, he used to give guidance, in interview, he was ready to do that. At the age of 80, once there was a big huge flood in Andhra Pradesh. Swami Ranganathananda ji said he will come to see the relief work of being conducted by Ramakrishna Mission. Swami Ranganathananda said, I will go there. 80 plus person. The Swami in charge said, it's all flood Swami ji, all mud and water. Where will I entertain you? And no one listening. He came with four IAS officers, big uh, government officers. He went there. And then there was no washroom. There was no room in that. He just sat and he said, I will stay here. Swamiji, there is no proper washroom. There is no roof at the washroom. It's all like ten. So somehow they met Swami, the who writes the story. He said, I feel like crying. My tears were coming from my eyes. I see love of this great old Swami for the poor people of... He generally met with so many people, rich and poor, all. Swami Ramanathanandji. Tears were coming from my eyes. Somehow I made this thing. And the Swamiji sat there. He started speaking to the poor people. He related himself to so many poor persons of the village who were suffering from this flood coming and all that in Andhra Pradesh in 1990. The story is. Once he was giving a talk in IIT, there were many professors and students, and he was answering their questions and all that. He found at the door was the doorkeeper. He couldn't understand anything of the English. Illiterate man, he didn't know English. Swami Ranganathandi saw him and said, What do you want? Why are you staying? You're standing there. Come here. He called him and uh, he told him everything that he told in Hindi. Whatever Hindi he knew, he all explained to that one person what was going on here. Sharing, participation, honoring, respecting everyone. No social difference status. Once he was coming by a taxi and uh, one person said, Swamiji, would you write a recommendation letter for me, for my son to get admitted in one of the Ramakrishna Mission schools, one of the best schools in Narendrapur. Oh, my letter will help you? Give me paper. He just wrote. Taxi driver, nothing, no, nothing was there. He didn't say anything. If my letter helps you, take it. If it doesn't help you, I don't know. So, nothing was there that will stop him, Swami Ramakrishna. One Panditji was there, he used to cook food in Delhi Ashram, just cook. And uh, he said, Swamiji, I want to put garland to Jawaharlal Nehru. Jawaharlal Nehru was the Prime Minister of the nation. He is a cook in an in in ashram. How this can happen? Any other person would have brushed aside. How can that you do? But Jawaharlal Nehru used to come. He came and he had seen there, but he couldn't do that. He had great desire to put the first Prime Minister at that moment. And he said one day he invited Jawaharlal Nehru and arranged that this person to garden that Jawaharlal Nehru with the garden. Just see of the, of the heart of this person, of this service, of this love for that what he said about the spiritual growth. That it radiate, that you we have love, we feel oneness with others. Let him do that. And he told that he wants to garden you, and that person really gardened the Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. So that was Swami Ramanathanandji, always ready to serve people whenever needed. When he was head of Hyderabad Center, at the half hours, one person come and wants to buy book. The book in charge and Brahmachari was there for whole day. He was working from the morning till uh, noon, and then there was time to close. Ranganathanandji said, uh, see, he has come here, he wants to buy book. And he said, Swamiji, I worked whole uh, days from the morning, he didn't come on time. Can't he come tomorrow uh, in, in time and uh, buy the book? Swami Ramanath didn't say anything to this Brahmachari. He could have just said, go and I say, go and open and give the book. He didn't say it. 
that concern for this Brahmachari also. What he did then? He didn't return back that person who had come from far away. He asked the key from Brahmachari. He was the head of the center. He had many monks and Brahmachari under him. He himself went to the bookstore after the lunch during his rest time, opened the book and gave that book to that person. So that was Ramana Ji, the real Karma Yogi. So erudite, so honored, so respected. He got the highest awards, highest respect from, uh, from the government of India, which he would not accept for himself. He said, I will not accept as a monk. If you want to give to our organization, Ramakrishna Mission, you can give. Gandhi Peace Prize, highest award uh, in, in, in India, in the government established. So they broke the government of India, respected the many people and the government respected so much that they broke the rule that was meant to give a human persons, but broke the rule and they gave to the Ramakrishna Mission the Gandhi Peace Award, which Swami Ramanathan accepted as the president of the order. So that was, that so I was the Ramanathan Muji, but how at the level of everyone, love for everyone without any distinction, rich or poor, literate or illiterate, whether professor or the doorkeeper, nothing is there. Everyone is the reflection of my soul. This my very soul is seen as so many persons. That is the radiating spirituality, radiating love outwards. And that can happen when we have tremendous amount of love, peace, devotion and the spirituality in us. And that, it can grow. We have, we have the quality capacity given by God. We have all the divine qualities latent in us. Avayam sattva samsutti, jnana yoga vivastiti, dhanam damasya yajnasya swadhyaya stapatyam, ahimsa satyam akroda tyaga sati rapaishunam, daya bhutyasva doduktam martavam reda chapalam. Dejak Shamatriti Shaucham Adroho Nati Manita Bhavanti Sampadam Devim Abhijato Siparata O Arjuna, O Bharata, you are endowed with these divine qualities. Not that you have to get it from outside, just to practice and to say Arjuna is that Arjuna is a representative of human being who suffers, who is deluded from the duties, who wants to give up when difficult times come. He just us in other form. Sri Krishna says to Arjuna, pointing to us, you have all these qualities, 24 26 divine qualities, and you can you have to manifest that in life. Grow inwardly and then reach out outward.